All right. Welcome, everybody. We are just uh, getting our technology all squared away. Uh, please be patient with us as we're coming in from four different locations, all of them very rural um, with not very great internet. Um, but my name is Rebecca Thistlethwaite, and I'm so happy that you could all join us. I am the director of the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network. We are an extension-based community of practice serving the niche meat industry from farm all the way to plate uh, and trying to help niche meat businesses and processors prosper and thrive. Uh, so today's webinar is a topic that we haven't touched on for a number of years. I think it's been about five years that we've talked about wastewater treatment. Um, so this is a topic that I continue to get a lot of questions about from uh, processors who are looking to get started or are looking to expand. And they often come up against uh, issues and concerns by their cities or counties or states around uh, wastewater treatment. <clears throat> so today's speakers are all operating USDA inspected slaughterhouse and further processing facilities. Um, and they're all located rurally on farms or right next to farms. And so none of them have access to municipal sewage treatment systems. So that is not an option for any of, of our three speakers today. So they each had to come up with their own systems that just worked appropriately for their sites. Um, and they continue to tweak their systems to make them better. So today we're going to focus mostly on wastewater, uh, but our speakers are also going to mention a little bit about what they do with their other inedible products um, coming out of their slaughterhouses. So our first speaker is Holly Zink of Sunnyside Meats in Durango, Colorado. And our second speaker is Greg Gunthorpe, of Gunthorpe Family Farms and Brushy Prairie Packing in Indiana. And then our third speaker is Brian Sapp of White Oak Pastures in Georgia. Um, so I'm gonna let them each talk for about 15 minutes. We're gonna save questions for the end. I'm gonna try to reserve about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A where all three of our speakers can answer your questions. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I am going to try to make this webinar stop exactly at the end of the hour. Um, it will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube site later if you want to watch it again or share it with colleagues. Um, if you'd like to ask a question during the webinar, please pop it in the chat box. And then when we get to the Q&A section, I will read through those questions and ask our speakers those questions. Um, so if you have a burning question in your mind, just pop it in the chat box and I'll make sure they get to it. So without further ado, so we can stay on time, I am going to let Ms. Holly <laughs> Pink share her screen and, and share some of her slides, okay? Oh, hi, Rebecca, can you hear me? Yes, so why don't you go okay. ahead and share if you can. This may take a couple minutes, it's okay. Oh, there, does that, can you see it now? Mm -hmm. okay, yep. Beautiful. All right, I'm just gonna move that off to the side. Okay, so um, I'm at Sunnyside Meats in Durango, Colorado. Uh, we have, uh, small USDA inspect processing facility and do own domestic wastewater, as Rebecca was saying. Um, we do about 700 to 750 beef per year, 350 hogs and about a thousand lambs is the volume that we're talking about here. So um, uh, I will, I've made this very scientific map of our wastewater treatment system. So um, we have about a thousand gallons per day of wastewater going into our system when we're operating at full capacity. Um, so you'll see the red line leaving the, the building is the waste the effluent um, heading into the system. 
The first place in the system is a series of six 1,500-gallon um, concrete tanks. The very first tank in the series, we ended up taking the concrete top off of it so that we can get in there and skim the fats that float to the top and dispose of them in the dumpster so that they aren't hanging out in the wastewater system. And then from there, the, the effluent travels into a couple of tanks that are aerated. Um, when we first installed this system, we didn't have aeration in those tanks, and we realized that the um, biological oxygen demand was too high, meaning the microbes that were in those tanks um, feeding on the proteins in the, and the solids in the effluent used up all the oxygen in that process, and then it became an anaerobic environment, and so the, the solids and the proteins and the effluent wasn't breaking down in a way that, um, that, was, that caused it to be fluid enough. It still was kind of sticky and gummy, so by the time that effluent reached the leach field, it was, it was clogging up our leach field. So we have an air blower, which is actually on the third floor of our building, but it pipes down and bubbles into those two tanks to keep the, to keep the microbes happy. The one thing that we noticed that is, that is a detriment with the aeration, um, and this is really operator error or training, is I'll show you when we get too much soapy water in the aerated tanks and that aeration is acting on the, on the create suds that flow up out of the tops of those tanks. And um, while we haven't fed dangerous system, I don't think that we're gonna have soap outside on the ground in that quantity. So that was one thing we learned there. Um, to the next settling tank, which has the screen. So as the um, sediment is settling out and the effluent is continuing into the next stage, that screen captures some of the solids. And about, let me see, um, that screen we clean about four times a year. So we take the screen and spray it off in the first tank, and so whatever solids are captured on it start back, back through the second broken down for another couple of settling tanks. One of these settling tanks has a pump that cycles the water into uh, tanks that have uh, textile filters hanging down. And so it's the, the pump presses the water through these pipes that have holes in them so the water gets sprinkled onto these textile filters. They're a porous fabric kind of material. And so, so a lot of the solids are captured at that stage and it sort of cycles through there a couple of times a day. And then as the, as the water that's treated um, floats to the top, it then leaves that cycle and heads into the leach field. And so those um, textile filters, we clean those about once a year. And I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. So there's our suds. And, oh, this is actually a diagram. If you were to purchase the Orenco Advantex AX20 system, as it is constructed by the manufacturer, here's what it would look like. We chose to purchase elements of this system and then modify it for our uses. So where you see the number two there, that's a large tank that comes prefabricated. We chose to use concrete tanks because it saved us a little bit of expense and because we had, we were dealing with a volume of wastewater that was larger than the capacity of this prefabricated unit. Um, so we spread our, our wastewater treatment system out a little bit. But if it was a if there was a facility that was that was producing less or working fewer days per year, um, they might look into the prefabricated system just for ease. So you can see number four is that's the the top is open. 
that is where the um, textile filters hang. Uh, number three is the screen and pump system, which the screen captures solids out of the effluent and then it pumps it up to sprinkle it over the top of that, um, that medium. And so that's what it looks like when it comes prefabricated. This is a outside shot of what it looks like with our subterranean tanks. So the four large rectangular shapes that you see there are the tops of the tanks that have the filters in them. The round things are openings into the concrete tanks that we can take the top off of the manhole and do maintenance that we need to do. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about maintenance later on, but um, for instance, sand and sediment being pumped out or if something cracks or breaks or when we take the cap off to skim um, the, the fats off of the floating, uh, the fats that are floating on the top, those are those entrances. So a nice feature of this system as well is that um, in the spring and the summer when there's green grass growing outside, it's hardly detectable and in the winter it's still not that unattractive. This is one of the textile filters. Um, they start out being fairly white and end up being fairly black. Um, you can kind of see there some worms growing on that. There's a close-up. So these textile filters do a really good job of creating a nice platform that's nutrient rich where we see you know, healthy microbial activity, we see small winged insects, we see centipedes, and then we see worms, and they sort of have a food chain, like the biggest thing eats the smaller thing, eats the smaller thing. But we do harvest sediment and worms out of those uh, filters to spread on agricultural soil for cultivation. This is a picture of the process of cleaning the filters and harvesting the material and the worms. Um, it is a fairly labor intensive process and as you can imagine isn't, the aroma isn't just peaches and cream, but um, since it's only a once a year event for us, I think that that indicates that this system is a low maintenance system. Um, so there's a handful of what that medium and what the, the worms look like that we then would put into a agricultural spreader and put on cropland. Um, this is us receiving a dump load of recycled wood materials, uh, chipped up wood materials from a local recycling company. We don't put our blood through our wastewater treatment system if we can help it. We prefer to compost the blood and we have a, a large um, uh, trailer that hooks up to a tractor that has an auger and a spreader. So we put recycled wood chips or old rotten hay in there with the blood that we capture. Um, we capture the blood in, in barrels and then that is spread on agricultural land. So here's a picture of coagulating blood and old hay that was cleaned out of a horse trailer. And then this is the spreader that we use. So what's shooting out the side of that spreader has gone through the auger and this is on our property. So to address some of the questions that Rebecca asked um, for us to prepare for, uh, kind of going back to the beginning, the, this system cost us about $40,000 to install and that was 20 years ago. Um, so it is a large upfront capital investment. The maintenance includes biannual skimming of fats, quarterly cleaning of settling tank screen, yearly cleaning of textile filters, and periodic pumping of settling tanks to remove sand and sediment, and repairing corroded parts and electrical elements. Um, the wastewater treatment system is a fairly acidic environment, so uh, we do see corrosion of wires and um, connectors. Uh, we think the pros of the system is that it is a sustainable system. Uh, it produces the valuable fertilizers for our agricultural soils. It's a durable system. It's inexpensive to operate and maintain and it's visually 
you know, like I said, is visually very uh, low profile and produces very little odor. Um, one of the things we would have done differently is start out with the aerated tanks in the first place because we did run into the hiccup with the effluent being too sludgy. So, um, and then some questions about land application. We don't do land application of any of the water that comes out of this system that was indicated it goes into the leach field. But as we're seeing here, spreading of the blood, um, we don't have special permitting for this and we don't do, uh, we don't collect samples or do scientific monitoring of concentrations or salinity or uh, protein values. And part of the reasons for that is we have, we have quite a bit of ground that we can spread on. So we're not concerned that we are getting too highly concentrated in one area. And um, we always, if we're going to spread on harvestable crops, we spread at least 120 days prior to harvest, which satisfies the Colorado Department of Agriculture um, and their desires about um, spreading blood materials. They come and inspect us annually for our organic inspection. So um, that relationship, they're satisfied with 120 days. And then as far as the question was, do we have issues in the winter with freezing or flooding or snow? And the answer to that is also no, we have not experienced any problems. Uh, the water that leaves the packing house is fairly warm and then the subterranean concrete tanks, um, we haven't had them freeze ever. And so, and our leach field is high in elevation and well drained. So uh, high in elevation on a slope. So we haven't had any flooding issues. And I think that's probably about my time. Thank you, Holly. That's super interesting. I'm sure people will have a lot of questions, but uh, we're gonna hold those to the end. Um, but yeah, I really, really enjoy learning about your system when I went and visited last year. So why don't you stop sharing your screen? And okay. we will go to Greg next. So Greg, you want to try booting? Um, let me get out of here. Okay. Uh, out, of, out of sharing. I can't find the mm -hmm. share, share button. Should be at the bottom. Right. <laughs> it sure should. Let's see. Um, uh, or up at the top, maybe. Stop share. There we go. I found it. Excellent. All right, Greg. I am going to make sure you are unmuted. Yes. And I'm going to mute you, Holly. <laughs> All right. Greg is booting up on his iPad. Excelente. All right, Greg, do you have uh, audio? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. And you can put your you can put your pretty picture up there too if you want to add video. Is it is my screen on? Uh, we don't see you. Oh, uh, how do I do that? I don't know. I don't know either. Um, <laughs> it's not a big deal if if we can't see you. Okay. Yeah, the world doesn't need to see me today. That's fine. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, great to be here. Uh, Greg Gunthorpe uh, from Gunthorpe Farms, and uh, we have a um, on-farm uh, USDA inspected processing plant. Uh, we raise, process, distribute pigs, chickens, ducks, and turkeys. Uh, primary customer base. You guys can read all that if you want. We sell mostly to upscale restaurants within our region. Uh, just a to give you a little bit of idea of the scale of our operation, just as it relates to, so we can start to gather how much uh, water we end up using. Uh, you know, we process during the season about 3,000 uh, chickens a week, um, about 50 to 60 um, pigs a week uh, year round, uh, 10,000 turkeys uh, seasonally, uh, about uh, close to half of those during the Thanksgiving season, and then ducks. Uh, not quite year round, but close to it. Um, uh, I'll try to put a um, 
link in the um, chat afterwards so that people can see uh, you know, we have a constructed wetland on our farm to treat the wastewater and uh, uh, our county, LaGrange County has been very, very progressive on waste treatment uh, and a constructed wetland is a basic uh, uh, aerobic, um, advanced aerobic treatment system, very similar to the system that we've just seen in the slides before, uh, slightly different in the way it's designed, but uh, same basic concept, you know, it's uh, um, taking water that's uh, high biological oxygen demand uh, and suspended solids and with retention time and aerobic bacteria is cleaning it up. And this is a picture of um, Purdue University has done some uh, studies on our constructed wetland and a couple others. Like I said, I'll put that link to that so if people want to read it. Uh, here's a couple pictures of uh, um, our second half of our system in the design process. A constructed wetland is basically a impermeable liner. So uh, um, in our case, it's a, a 40 mil PVC liner. Uh, the hole is about five foot deep with slope sides on each of it. Uh, three different sizes of rocks um, in the construction and then the water just has to flow horizontally through it uh, with a um, pump that uh, re uh, recirculates some of the water on the on pea gravel on the smallest rocks on the top of it, which are now flooded all the time. Um, I think before I get started talking about our actual wetland, I think, our, um, I think the most confusing part that we had in the process, and I think where lots of people find trouble, is the, uh, navigating the whole regulatory hurdle. You know, USDA Food Safety Inspection Service um, has the authority and the obligation and the regulations to ensure that Food and poultry establishments have an approved waste treatment system. Uh, I think where lots of us get caught up, and I definitely got caught up uh, close to 20 years ago, is that USDA does not approve waste treatment systems. And those are completely separate agencies. And in our case, it was the um, uh, we had to get our county health department, our state um, uh, health department, our state Indiana Department of Environmental Management. Um, to all agree that the waste treatment system that we were going to put in was um, allowed. Um, and our biggest holdup actually was our county at first. And then uh, once we realized that a um, constructed wetland fit into their um, thought process of what would work, uh, it was a relatively simple process after that. Um, the um, one thing I would add um, on that. Um, regulatory and approval process is that, um, uh, that lots of times engineers and regulators don't understand the um, waste flows coming out of processing plants. Um, you know, in our case, processing poultry, um, you know, if you're dumping scalders or dumping uh, chill tanks, um, at the same time, you got several people uh, washing, uh, you know, peak flows cause uh, can cause serious issues. Uh, waste treatment uh, systems tend to be not need to be built just based on uh, gallons per day, but they need to be built based on peak flows. Um, our construction process uh, ended up being relatively um, uh, simple. Our county uh, allowed us to um, build ours ourselves. Um, we spent about $6,000 initially for the engineer for the first half of our system and we spent about twenty thousand dollars total uh, for that first half of the system for um, materials and engineering um, we've uh, doubled the size of our system uh, since it started uh, mostly because of expansion partially also because of uh, uh, making it somewhat easier to maintain that i'll talk about um, later uh, because of uh, you know we um, slaughter pigs, uh, chickens, um, and uh, any blood, feathers, and hair um, going into a constructed wetland end up in the most anaerobic portion of the wetland, and the wetland can't deal with those. Um, our system, uh, and there's another webinar, and there's other, some other pictures of it online too, uh, explaining it, but our system is a recirculating constructed wetland, and it's uh, um, about a hundred foot by a hundred foot square and it's divided into um, four cells and as you've seen in those pictures earlier the cells are about uh, 
five foot deep. Uh, there are large rocks on the bottom, uh, very large at the inlet and the outlet, and then uh, you know one to two inches around the rest of it, and then the top of it is pea gravel, as you can see in the picture. Um, depending on the time of year, it takes water from the time it goes down our drain uh, till it comes out as effluent out the end of our system. It takes about three to fourteen days. Um, and you know the calculations uh, for that end up being about retention time and wetlands with rocks. Um, if anybody wants to do the math, uh, they contain about 40%. So the rocks take up about 60% of the space, so they can hold about 40% of water based on the same uh, space without rocks. Um, for a pretreatment before our wetland, we have six 1,000 gallon tanks, and those are in series. So every bit of the water goes through each and every one of those tanks, goes into the first tank. The um, clarified water from that goes into the second tank. The, those first six tanks in series are largely to catch most of the fats, oils, and grease um, because that tends to float. Um, solids tend to sink. Um, and so you get clarified water um, out of the middle of the septic tank. Um, and then from those six uh, tanks in series, uh, we have a distribution box and one sixth of the water goes into six uh, separate tanks. And this is all before it goes into the wetland. And the amount of water we use now, I wish that we'd have uh, put those in as larger tanks so that it had some uh, longer retention time beforehand because uh, that's probably the biggest drawback of the system is uh, any of that organic material, um, uh, the bigger pieces getting into the wetland. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the wetlands are just in a form of a aerobic advanced treatment uh, that just fit between the septic tank and the land application. You know, and their role is to significantly lower the biological oxygen demand and the um, suspended solids. Um, their advantages, I think they're one of the most economical and environmentally uh, sound alternative for waste treatment. Uh, for decentralization, for a decentralized waste treatment saw in rural America. Um, their discharge uh, by all of our testing would meet any regulatory requirement even to be dumped back into a body of water. The, uh, what they do for the um, uh, suspended solids and biological oxygen, and I was uh, skeptical at first, but it's amazing how well they work. Um, their disadvantages is that uh, they require some maintenance, and their biggest disadvantage, if you don't build the pre-treatment ahead of them uh, large enough, uh, the inlets can become plugged because of blood, um, feathers, pig hair, um, any of the organic material that will be uh, pushed uh, through the system, especially during uh, peak flows when you're running excess water down the drain. Um, you know, another disadvantage is they, they do require some maintenance. Um, you know, it's a completely different um, than just being hooked up to city sewer that the water is just gone and it's somebody else to maintain. Um, it's not a build it and forget it system, it's a living system and uh, no two of them are exactly the same. So uh, repairs aren't just something out of the book there. Uh, depends on what the system is doing. Um, I can't overstate the um, approval process um, and, the, um, and there's a lot more resources now, but. I think lots of people when they build um, plants uh, don't cut and completely understand that uh, waste treatment outside of the city uh, can be the um, thing that holds up building a processing plant. I've seen it many, many times. And depending on the jurisdiction, the cost can be uh, very, very high. Um, and I think the big thing that people have to keep in their mind is that mindset that it's the um, person that's going to build the plant. Uh, that needs to come up with a, a approved waste treatment, work with an engineer, work with their uh, local soil and water, uh, come up with some kind of uh, engineered system that will uh, treat their water before it goes back into the ground, whether that's in a drain field or land applied. Because in most jurisdictions, if you do that, they'll allow you to uh, have a waste treatment system. Um, as far as maintenance and testing on our um, wetland, uh, our county health department does water testing on our wetland on both uh, the um, 
effluent and the water coming into it. Uh, they tested monthly at first, uh, they tested quarterly, uh, they're testing annually now because the tests all come back uh, the same and all come back uh, very good. Uh, and our biggest thing that we have to do is uh, make sure that we keep the um, tanks pumped so that we're not allowing um, solids to keep getting pushed further down the system and end up in our wetland. Um, uh, that was all the slides I had. Um, I think in designing a um, system, I think that a person uh, needs to get a good idea of the gallons per day that they're going to um, uh, use. Um, and I think there's a lot more resources on that now, um, you know, on numbers of gallons per animal. Uh, you know, chickens, I think it can be anywhere from uh, three to 10 gallons per bird, depending on whether you're going to air chill, how. Uh, much water you're going to use in the process. There's also numbers out there for uh, red meat. Um, need to know your peak flows. Uh, and need to know the organic load. You know, if you're going to put blood into the system, the system would have to be massively bigger if you're not going to compost that or send that off to rendering. Um, cost on our system, uh, we spent about $20,000, as I mentioned, uh, to build the first half. Um, and then we spent an additional um, about $20,000 to uh, double the size of it. Uh, if I had it to do over again, um, the thing that we would change is that uh, we would build our uh, pre-treatment uh, significantly larger. Um, and we'd probably also put some kind of pre-treatment in uh, before it went into a wetland that we were able to uh, remove easy, maybe some kind of concrete structure with some uh, pea gravel in it that we were able to completely remove the um, pea gravel and start over. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. Um, we're collecting some good questions for you at the end, but now we are going to switch to Brian Sapp. So, Brian, you want to try to boot up your screen? And let's get Brian unmuted. Brian, can you hear us? Are you there? Yes, I had you muted as well. I think I'm good now. Awesome, great. Now we see your pretty face. So, oh, very good. <laughs> you want to try uh, sharing your screen now? Oh, I thought I did. I just see a white, blank, a blank white. Hang on just a second. No worries. I see something booting up. Here we go. All right, Brian, take it away. I'm going to mute myself. All right, good morning. Uh, my, my name is Brian Sapp. I'm the Director of Operations at White Oak Pastures in Bluffton, Georgia. Uh, we have a, uh, a two different processing facilities on the farm. The first facility was a red meat facility that was built in 2008. Uh, the wastewater system was designed for that facility to begin with, um, and it is a, a, a capture hold uh, pump system where we land apply the effluent on about 30 acres uh, surrounding the facility um, to get. Where's my slide? Hang on just a second. So what we have, uh, the, the original system was six 6,000 gallon underground tanks behind the, the meat processing facility. Uh, water flows from uh, drains in the facility into these tanks. The tanks are connected in series. Water flows out of the top of each tank into the next tank. Um, where we're most concerned uh, for, for our effluent is uh, suspended solids um, and, and nitrogen loading as we spray that uh, effluent onto the field. So these, this system uh, expanded in 2011 to include uh, the, the poultry facility. Um, so what we did there was, was included another, uh, about 10,000 gallons of underground storage uh, to capture uh, wastewater coming directly out of the poultry facility. And then that water is pumped back to the original system um, 
at, behind the, the meat processing plant. So everything from both facilities now flows in uh, to this first tank where the white pipe is, um, either direct flow or pump from, from the poultry facility. So we're processing about 130 head of cattle a week. Um, we're processing 25 to 30 goats and sheep uh, probably about every two weeks. Uh, on the poultry side, we're processing uh, about 1,200 chickens a week, 12 to 1,500 chickens a week, and then turkeys, ducks, geese, guineas um, as well on that side. So our, our affluent totals are, are typically around three to 5,000 gallons per day, uh, five days a week. And as Greg mentioned, um, you know, peak flows for us has always, has always been an issue, um, especially on, you're coming from the poultry side and it, and it washed down. Um, this, this was, you know, this, this original um, system, you know, was designed around, you know, about 150 head of cattle um, per, per month. Um, is, is kind of what it was designed for, but we've, we've made some changes as well when we had it on the poultry facility. Um, these are again the, the, the underground tanks. Um, after the water goes through these tanks, it is pumped into uh, this holding pond, and we added this um, as our, our, our cattle numbers increased over and above what we kind of set the system to do to begin with, and then added the poultry plant. So this, uh, this line, fully lined pond, um, is what catches affluent out of the, the last of the six 6,000-gallon uh, 6, holding tanks uh, behind the facility. Uh, and this, this pond will hold about 25,000 gallons, um, so there's about five days' worth of storage here. And the, reason, the biggest reason we had to add this is um, in our land application uh, permit uh, handed down by the state of, of Georgia, uh, we can only spray affluent um, at so many inches per acre per day, and we also are hindered by uh, rainfall. You know, if, if it's raining, we cannot pump a fluid and, and spread it on top of the ground. So this uh, constructed pond um, was built, you know, to, to help alleviate a lot of that, a lot of those issues, uh, you know, with peak flows and as well as, um, you know, times when we couldn't a land apply uh, that affluent. Uh, so, this, so this is a, uh, a stationary electric pump that pumps out of this, this pond, and that is going into a, uh, a piping system where we have risers out in the fields that feed into this uh, traveling gun. So this reel um, on the left and then the, the traveling gun on the right, uh, so that traveling gun can be pulled out on a um, you know, on a on a line that's about 600 feet long, and the the reel has a, a small electric or a small gas powered pump that reels the the, the, the gun back to it very slowly. Um, so engineering had to go into the you know the, the size of the nozzle in the sprayer, uh, the timing on you know how fast the traveling gun comes back, the you know the, the width of the spray. And then we have to monitor that uh, that affluent amount, um, you know, per gallons per acre um, per day, uh, and we report that back to uh, Georgia Environmental Protection Division on a uh, per inches per day uh, per acre. Um, so one of the biggest costs of this whole system, uh, you know, after we added on the poultry, the pond. Um, and you know, have a complete system. This whole system was about $150,000 worth. Uh, one of the biggest costs in this is these uh, groundwater monitoring wells. So within these fields, we have um, we have about 10 total wells that were drilled, um, and those wells cost upwards of $6,000 a piece to drill. Um, and what these are used for is to uh, test groundwater. Um, both uh, groundwater that is coming into the fields and groundwater that is moving through and, and, and out of the fields, um, up gradient and down gradient testing of actual groundwater. Um, so we had to install these wells to meet uh, different requirements within the, uh, the permit for groundwater testing. Um, and those, over the last two years, those regulations have become more stringent uh, for testing of groundwater where all groundwater um, entering and, and leaving the spray fields have to meet minimum drinking requirements uh, mandated by the state. Uh, so we had to actually add 
um, a few more of these wells uh, to make sure that we were you know testing the correct groundwater, um, you know the correct gradients of groundwater, and then uh, you know being able to report those back. Um, so kind of getting away from the the wastewater system. Um, before I get away from it, you know, kind of the pros of this system is it's pretty easy to keep up. Um, you know, as far as you know, uh, maintenance on it, we pump the uh, the underground tanks about once a month to get the sediments off the bottom. Typically, that's the first two tanks. Um, we pump the uh, the holding pond about once a year, um, and then we put gas in the in the reel, and that that's pretty much the system as far as uh, physical maintenance. Um, you know, the, the cons of this is the uh, is the time and effort and cost that goes into uh, testing and uh, you know meeting regulatory requirements uh, from the state on um, you know drinking water standards. We have to pull soil tests once per quarter. We have to test water once per uh, fluent water once per month. Um, so the upkeep on this system is is expensive in the in the fact that the testing um, of the of the affluent, the testing of the groundwater, and the testing of the soil, um, you know, on a monthly you know, on a on a, uh, a monthly and quarterly basis. And and my estimate on that, you know, to keep this system up is about fifty thousand dollars per year, uh, just in testing um, and and third party uh, engineer firms that come do that testing for us. Uh, so that that is that is definitely the con. You know, if we if we had to do this system over again. Uh, we would lean heavily on Greg um, and, and his constructed wetlands uh, system because I think that that really fits into to more of what we we try to do. Um, so getting away from that, our uh, so we do capture uh, similar to everybody else is capture all of the blood uh, from any any animal that we process, uh, but that blood is put into an anaerobic aerobic digester. So this uh, this cabinet you see has the door on top. It has a uh, some large paddles inside of it that churn um, some some charcoal uh, bricks inside. Uh, so it, it creates a system. We dump that blood in, and it, it breaks that blood down um, over time into a. Um, I thought I had a picture. I think I got out of order. Into a, uh, a a soil amendment that we can use back on the farm. Um, so we pump it. It goes into the tank down there at the bottom of this slide underground, and then we pump it up into this uh, this wagon, um, and then we spray that back on um, on some fields at the farm, uh, but not in not back into the the same fields where we spray affluent. Um, the solids, so uh, everything that we we can't sell that we don't have a market for, whether it be bones, um, feathers. All goes through this system. Uh, the big green machine on the left is a uh, is a pre breaker, so it's it's grinding everything up. Um, it would grind up you know beef bones into something the size of your pinky finger, um, and then we take that, put it on a dump truck, and then we're composting that here on the farm with a, a carbon source, and that carbon source is typically uh, peanut hulls or um, you know something out of the cotton gin. We call it gin trash. Um, you know, so those are are cheap and readily available for us uh, to use as a as a carbon source for our composting operation. So that's kind of the end of my slide uh, to leave some time for some questions. Awesome, thank you, Brian. Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat box so far, so I will go up to the very top. And Matthew asks. What regulations prompted Holly? Holly, make sure you're unmuted. Uh, let's unmute everybody here, actually. Um, what regulations prompted Holly to put in such a complicated system? I think some of it maybe had to do with her dad. <laughs> Was storage and land application possible instead? Go ahead, Holly. Um, so we, we actually, I forgot to mention this earlier. We do have, oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So we are actually, this, this slaughterhouse is on private property, but we are very close to, um, 
tribal reservation land. So our system is also, I forgot to mention, is inspected by the federal government, but not the USDA. It's a, a federal tribal um, agreement. So part of part of the way that we, part of the reason that we did things the way that we did is because we had this um, extra layer of inspection that um, spreading spreading on croplands here would be a little bit more difficult for us than I think some of the other circumstances we heard about. Hmm. Okay. Um, so you had an extra layer of tribal. And also, my father is an engineer. And he likes to make things difficult <laughs> or complicated. <laughs> it is a unique system for sure. Uh, does he um, advise others to install that system, or is he consulted with other processors to set up a similar system? I don't believe that he's done any consulting, and he is very pleased with our system. Mm -hmm. Because once, I mean, once it was installed, it's been a, a really easy system to run. Awesome. Well, get in touch with Holly if you want her dad to uh, consult for lots of money, I imagine. <laughs> um, next question. Dennis asks, I'm curious about the necessary compliance issues that you are all needing to contend with. Some of you discussed that. Also, are the regulations mostly imposed at the federal, state, or local level? So why don't we just start with Holly. Any, anything else you want to add about that? So, like I said, you know, we have this, we have a federal level of inspection that's unique to us because of our location. And then um, just being responsible to the county, uh, the county health regulations but we don't we don't spend much time dealing with regulatory entities with the system that we have. Mm -hmm. How about Greg? We deal almost exclusively with our county health department on ours, mm -hmm. and they they've been really good to work with. Yeah, once you guys figured out the whole constructed wetland thing, they've been really gung ho, right? And and have actually. Um, been a leader in the whole country for constructed wetlands for other manufacturing facilities, right? Exactly, yes. Yeah, um, I think you can even go on the LaGrange County website and find more information about constructed wetlands. I recall seeing uh, some information about that. Yeah, yeah they even have done peer-reviewed uh, studies and everything imaginable. That's awesome. And how about you, Brian? You you touched a little bit on some of the regulatory issues. Uh, who's you know who's the main entity that you have to deal with? Yeah. So so when we when we built the the original facility, it was it was interesting to to see them uh, try to position themselves. Uh, you know, we started with the with the local county health department. Uh, they said it was too big for them. We went to the state EPD. They said it was too small for them. So we were kind of in a, in a situation where somebody had to figure something out. Uh, so we finally got the state to take it. Um, so we are uh, strictly regulated by the, the state of Georgia. Um, so that's who we, we do all of our reporting to. You know, all of our changes, engineering has to go through uh, the, the state level. Um, so it's, I think it really depends on, on where you're located as to you know, who, who wants it or who can take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it really depends on kind of the environmental conditions of your region. I imagine Georgia has, you know, you have more wetlands, you probably have a higher water table, and you have more issues with like flooding, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, so obviously wastewater is, is a bigger deal there than say the highlands of Colorado. Um, Matthew asks, how much decreased treatment occurs during Indiana's winter season? Were the basins designed to account for seasonal variations? Greg? You know, we're fortunate in that we're partially um, seasonal on our birds. We do a lot less birds in the winter, um, so that helps a lot. But um, I've been amazed the um, wetlands still continue to function very well um, through the winter. Uh, you know, I think if we had a really, really long winter, I think it would get more difficult because the um, organic uh, and the solids do tend to build up a little bit, but the 
wetland heats them all up during the summer. Mm -hmm. And and also you're putting quite a bit of hot water into that system, right? So that probably yeah. helps keep things unfrozen. Yeah, I mean we've we the only uh, trouble that we've ever had really that was cold related was our first manifold we put in with uh, for the recirculating we put in with PVC pumps and we had a couple of them uh, bust and we use a black plastic pipe now so if it because uh, they they go on and then shut off and during that off time if the water doesn't come out quick enough they can freeze uh, but then the fresh water thaws them back out but freezing pipes, PVC breaks. We, I mean, we learned a little bit, but they still work through the winter fine. And also for you, Greg, I think this is for you, uh, what criteria or testing parameters does your county test for? Do uh, I know that you said they used to test a lot more frequently and now yep. they've moved to annual because you're obviously meeting their standards. Uh, what, what are the standards they're testing for? Um, the main thing they're testing for is uh, biological oxygen demand and uh, total suspended solids, but they've also done some uh, indicator organism, uh, generally generic E. coli, to show how much of it dies off through the process. Um, I attached a link in that um, uh, in the chat box. I don't know if that will end up staying with the recording on the um, webinar, yeah. but it shows what um, Purdue's testing and some of the results. They also, because uh, Purdue did some uh, nitride levels, and uh, nitri various nitrogens, uh, it's uh, all in that uh, PDF on the okay. link. I will provide that link to all the attendees um, when I send everyone a survey at the end. Uh, speaking of testing, Brian, um, what do you have to test for in those monitoring wells? Yeah, so so we do two different types of testing. One is direct affluent testing, and that's similar to Greg, uh, you know, VODs, total suspended solids, uh, some nitrogen, phosphorus, um, you know, for that suspended solid, or excuse me, for that affluent. Um, so, so things have changed a little bit. Uh, so our, we used to have limits on all of those for the actual affluent, um, and those were regulatory limits that we had to meet. Uh, when they swapped over to uh, testing water to meet drinking standards, uh, those those affluent testing standards are no longer regulatory for me. But if we don't meet drinking water standards on the groundwater, they become your regulatory. Um, so that's you know so there are limits on you know operating limits on affluent for phosphorus and nitrogen for land applications, uh, but they're kind of a, a working limit. Uh, where we get into hard limits are on uh, drinking water or groundwater testing uh, from those wells. Um, we don't have an annual fee per se from Georgia. There may be a $50 uh, you know, application fee or something, uh, but we do have to uh, submit a renewal um, every three years through a um, through a um, an engineering firm that costs probably you know eight to ten thousand dollars every three years for that renewal. And speaking of land application, um, you know, do you do your own personal testing to make sure that you're not over applying phosphorus, nitrogen, or perhaps uh, too much salt for those fields? So we, uh, we, we personally test the affluent um, because again, they're not as regulatory as they used to be, uh, but we do have third party uh, that comes in and, and pulls samples from the testing wells to report those uh, groundwater samples and that does the soil sampling as well. Mm. And those fields that you land to play, are you able to cut hay off of them? Um, can you graze on them, or are they just plain fields, just growing? We uh, we started out we started out trying to graze them. Um, we got a nitrogen overload uh, on some soil tests, so now we're to the point where we're removing you know, removing the forage through through hay. Mm. Uh, so they're just hay fields now. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Thomas asks, also for you, Brian, have recent hurricanes, tropical storms impacted your system and the land application permit and plan? And is the system overwhelmed and can you emergency apply on wet ground during severe storms? Yeah, so we, you know, especially the big storm back in late 2018, we did a lot of preparation, you know, three to five days before that, you know, knowing that it was, you know, kind of headed our way. Uh, we, we typically, 
you know, we typically try to, to, to keep our holding pond on the bottom. Um, you know, that gives us, you know, about five days of flexibility in production. Um, you know, if we get a big rain, we don't have to spray for a couple of days. Um, so typically if we have good days, you know, we, we pump and move that traveling gun, you know, as much as we can, you know, to, to keep that pond as empty, you know, for, for emergency purposes. Um, you know, so, so yeah, there, there's some, you know, some, some effort on our part to make sure we don't run it over. Um, you know, they do, you know, they do offer us some, you know, some benefits, you know, if we have, you know, in the last, you know, three weeks, we've had, you know, over 12 inches of rain. Um, so they factor in rain amounts, um, you know, in our, in our system, uh, you know, in that pond, you know, where we can apply to some wet ground, you know, we have to tell them, hey, you know, we're in a situation either it's going to run over, we have to get it out. Um, you know, so they do, there is some, a little bit of flexibility in those numbers. Uh, speaking of applying to ground in the winter, Holly, um, have you ever had to apply on top of snow? And uh, what do the neighbors think of that when you're applying like blood compost out on top of snow? I know that I've heard that being an issue in, uh, you know, snowy states. Are you still there, Holly? Yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> yeah, I Yes, we have applied blood compost on top of snow. And typically, if we're going to do that during the winter, um, we will choose one of our pastures that isn't neighbor facing. So we have about 200 acres um, on one of our properties and another 100 on another property. So we have a lot of space to choose from. Mm -hmm. And we, we typically, it, that's a very good question. We try not to just go right down by the county road and leave a great big swath of of red spray everywhere. Yeah, I've, I've heard about, you know, in the Midwest on the dairies, them applying manure on top of snow, and uh, I don't think neighbors appreciate that particularly. Um, speaking of uh, pissing off the neighbors or not, um, have any of you guys had any excess smells that's impacted any neighbors or um, any issues along neighbor relations? We don't have neighbors. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not really fair because you have how many? Well, that, makes, that makes it easier. <laughs> <laughs> like, we have, I mean, <laughs> the only neighbor that the smell impacts is me. Um, <laughs> I'm the closest residence to the packing house and there are times in the summer where the blood wagon contents get pretty ripe yeah and so, um as long as we get the the we empty it once a week in the summer and get that spray pretty fine and out there and hopefully a breeze comes and within a couple of days it's fine but I don't think it's impacted anybody any of the other residences in our neighborhood how about you, Greg? Any any smells? Um, our wetland uh, um, is right beside the road, and there'll be an occasional time that you can smell it just literally driving by within a few feet of it. But other than that, you can't smell it. Um, the only thing that we've ever offended the neighbors on, I'm ashamed to say, is if we don't compost correctly, uh, that stuff can uh, stink to high heaven. But our wastewater treatment doesn't smell at all. Awesome. Well, that's part of the reason I invited the three of you all because you're doing such a nice job there and not upsetting the neighbors uh, or you just buy 3,000 acres or 5,000 acres and then it's not an issue, right? Um, Matthew asks, if a business-owned farmland was not available at a Georgia location, would blood and composted solids be ship shipped off-site? Which method is cheapest? So if you didn't have that land to apply, what would you do, Brian? I mean, our only option would be to to send it off in a rendering truck. Um, you know, you you know, used to they would pay you for the stuff. Used to they would pick it up for free, and now they're starting to charge you. Um, another big issue with that, especially in a in a, a beef slaughter plant, is segregating uh, you know over 30 months uh, stuff uh, from the renderers. Uh, they they become really stringent on you know that separation. Uh, we actually we separated already you know for our composting operation. Um, you know, just to make sure we're keeping that, that SRM stuff in a, we put it in a compost pile that'll probably never leave here or never be used here, but it is segregated. Um, 
you know, so there, I mean, there's a cost in all of it, you know, for us, uh, we probably get a lot of, we do get a lot of benefit out of composting and using our compost on the farm. Um, it costs us some to get it composted. Um, but, you know, you're looking at a rendering company, you know, you'll have to pay them forever. Um, you know, so they're, you know, that's really about the only two options you have. Uh, we do not sell any compost, uh, and I say it's probably similar around the country. You know, if you're if you're making and selling compost, you have to have, you know, it's another inventory problem to go through uh, to be able to sell that product. Brian, speaking of compost, a couple more questions came in. Uh, do you think it would work if you didn't grind the bones? So if somebody had more of like a static pile system where the bones are just sitting in there for six months or so? Yeah, I'm having a hard time hearing you, but uh, we we used to windrow the bones and let them dry with the sun and then come back and chip them up uh, to put them in the compost. You know, it was nasty. It was, it stunk. I mean, it was, it was bad all the way around. That's why we put in that, uh, that grinder at the plant. So it goes directly into the compost before it starts to stink. Do you have a windrow turner, Brian, or uh, how do you turn your piles? Yeah, we, we, t uh, we turn it with a front end loader. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then I just had one more question. Speaking of spe specified risk material, uh, SRM, so that is from animals over 30 uh, months old. Um, is there, so you said you're probably never going to apply that compost. Is that correct? Correct. So uh, I guess you don't have to worry about whether or not that could impact your living cattle on the farm and spread. yeah i mean that, you know and that's the reason we've done it you know there's a there's some gray area in in those regulations and how that looks um so we decided just to keep it separate and you know that'll probably be there forever mm -hmm. holly do you uh process animals over 30 months old and do you handle their uh blood differently um we do process animals over 30 months old as far as blood, though, I wasn't aware that it might be considered an SRM. I thought that was only central nervous system and parts of the lower intestine. Mm. Um, so yeah, as far as blood composting, we don't segregate that at all. And then our, um, our paunches and um, bones and hooves go to the landfill and we haven't had any any regulatory um, conflict with sending all of it at the same time. It's not, it's not going to go into a food chain. It's not going to go into an agricultural fertilizer uh, application. So it's, it all goes the same place for us. Awesome. Hey, with the three of you guys, I'll put your emails on there and make sure you, you send it to all attendees um, in the chat box. And our next NPAN webinar that I am organizing right now, and it's probably going to be late February or early March, is all about smoked meats and smokehouse operations. So we're going to have a couple panelists who make uh, high quality smoked meat products. And then we're also going to have a smokehouse rep talk about smokehouse safety and how not to burn your plant down. Um, so look for that on the NPAN website and look for... <laughs> Uh, we hope you can join us for that next webinar. I think it'll be a fun one. I know I like smoked meats as much as possible. <laughs> so thank you all so much for being here. This has been a really interesting webinar and I will post this to YouTube. Um, so that'll be up by tomorrow. And with that, I thank you all and hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.